Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, with this title, I'm wondering, uh, it's an evocative title, but I promise there will be no swears during this open source rant. And actually, this is going to be a lighthearted and fun kind of, kind of discussion about open source. We're, we're even going to start with some Taylor Swift discussion. So um, I want you, I, everyone needs to raise their hand to start, and we're going to see who is the biggest Swifty in the room. However, if you are not a Swifty, but your significant other is a Swifty, you can represent them on your behalf by, by doing it. So raise your hand, everyone. <laughs> okay, if you did not know that Taylor Swift is dropping an album on October 21st, drop your hand. Okay, we've, that was like almost everyone. That was level one. <laughs> that was level one, everyone. I'm not even a big Swifty. That was level one. Okay, now, the next one is, um, if you do not know what this is, drop your hand. Okay, we've got, wait, no? I was ever, okay, no one made it to level two. No one made it to level two. There were four levels. <laughs> um, this is, uh, so, in case you're unaware, um, there's a huge fandom for Taylor Swift and they have conspiracy theories, fan theories, lots of things. She has four different versions of her vinyl album that are coming out. And if you buy all four ones, they form a clock. And the title of the album is called Midnights. It's about midnights in her life. Anyway, that was my icebreaker to kick off the talk. <laughs> Not related at all to open source. <laughs> you all failed. At Taylor Swift. This, there's a lot of dudes in here. Your partners probably would be ashamed of you. Okay. Let's start off by asking why do you write code? And I put on here some of why I write code. Um, so I got into code as a kid, as a nerd. Um, I was into calculator programming. That's what's on the left, TI-83 plus with TI Basic. I created the entirety of Monop Mon Monopoly, the board game, as a menu-based game, including multiple players and trades. <laughs> that was one of my first forays. I also got into a Star Wars game and built a website for it as a kid, um, Star Wars Combine. Uh, you can see the pseudo exclamation point, exclamation point. Um, this one is a little bit of a joke. I got into Linux as a kid, and um, I had no idea what I was doing with Linux, and so you just Google, and then they give you a command, and then you paste it and hope for the best. And when it doesn't work, you just put pseudo in front of it. <laughs> That's how I got into it. Pseudo with the two exclamation points, depending on your shell, will just repeat your previous command um, with pseudo for super user privileges. So this is how I got into it. Also, I went, I went into computer science at college. Um, and so I got into coding because I loved it. I loved coding, absolutely loved it. You sit me in front of a computer and you say, write some code, <laughs> and I loved it. And that love is gone, it's dead. I'm trying to rediscover it, I'm trying to rediscover it, but it has been ruined, and open source is part of that. Um, there are other parts of it too. But um, yeah, that, for me, what this talk is, is trying to rediscover that love, but also trying to explain how one person might lose their connection with a hobby that was fun and how you might try to refine it. So now the next question is open source. Um, so not just code now, but open source. Um, so why do you write open source if you do write open source code? Or if you don't, why do you use it? And my answer I think is a little different than most companies or people. 
Um, a lot of people use open source because that's how you build a business. Um, for me, that, that isn't really how open source has been for me. So um, single spa and single spa workshop are related to my income. Uh, and so there are some business components of my interaction with open source. But then we've got some more interesting fun things over here, me still being a nerd as a 32 year old. So the middle one is a logo for Project 64. And Project 64 is an open source emulator, Windows only, unfortunately. There are some that are not Windows only. Um, and I have learned how to write code in it a little bit with some ambitious plans to implement rollback net play code for Super Smash Bros for the N64. There are still people who play that game, including me. The shirt that I'm wearing is a jersey with the characters from that game on there. I wear it when I go to a tournament. <laughs> um, I went to a tournament last weekend and took seventh. It was the best I've ever done. Um, so I do open source because I like it. So I, um, I really like that game and I wanted to make the emulator better. And so I got into it. Um, I play Yoshi, that's why there's a Yoshi up there. My gamer tag, fake name, is Cyan King K. Rule. And so we've got K. Rule here. And to prove to you, in case you have doubts still, which I don't think you do, um, here is me, if this loads, here is a two hour and 14 minute video of me live streaming. So at the bottom right is me reacting to, and I've got to advance a little bit. Let's load. It's me watching a game that I played and analyzing it, trying to figure out why I won and why I lost. <laughs> Um, and so for me, that's the kind of motive that I have for open source. I'm going to hope that this loads. Please load. There it is. So um, yeah, I'm talking, I'm going through looking at it. This is why I do open source. I do it because I like it. <laughs> And um, unfortunately, I've had some bad experiences with it. I've also had some good experiences as well, which we'll get into. Um, so what went wrong? Um, I know there are a few people who follow me on Twitter who are in this room. Um, for those who don't, um, this is the kind of thing that you can expect. I don't recommend following me. Um, like 95 tweets of me just raging about how much I hate open source, coding, lots of things. I deviate, I go into all sorts of topics. Nothing is safe. <laughs> uh, um, there are lots of swears there. Um, like it's, it's nothing safe. It took me 105 minutes to get through it. <laughs> and you can see the only reason why I stopped was because I needed food, drink, and bathroom. <laughs> Could have kept going. Could have kept going. This was open source therapy number one. <laughs> the idea being that maybe there could be a number two, number three, um, number four. So for me, this, it really soured. It really soured um, for me. Let me explain to you part of why it soured. <laughs> um, so I'm going to open up my GitHub queue. OK. All that I want you to look at, really, is up here, the inbox with 694. That means there are 694 GitHub notifications. Some of them are like automated dependency upgrades, but a lot of them are not. Um, the last time I went through my queue, there were about 2,000. Um, right now, there's only 694. Um, for about three or four years, I went through this queue daily, on Saturdays even. Um, and I would respond to anybody who asked me questions about any of the open source that I had written, or if they proposed changes. I gave a lot of myself. Uh, I gave a lot of myself for free. 
and I regret it. <laughs> I regret it entirely. Um, I've told people this before. I would prefer that single spot didn't exist and that I had never created it because of the pain of, of uh, what has happened. Now, a lot of that is due to my own decisions. So I'm not blaming, like I blame myself for a lot of it as well. But the open source community is broken. It is broken. It takes in nice little kids who like Super Smash Bros, chews them up, and spits out a completely broken individual. Um, now, I'm not totally broken. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a bit. But it, it does burn you out. Um, now, there are ways you can do it where maybe that doesn't happen. Um, and I think we've got one here in the room. Maybe. <laughs> maybe we've got more. There are people who know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. And I did it a way that really didn't work for me. OK. Let's see. This slide. So open source maintenance. When you are an open source creator, your job is to play customer support for annoying people. It's your job. And these people, are they are annoying. <laughs> they will go into your DMs. I've had phone calls um, to my personal phone. Don't know how they got it. Uh, I've had emails um, directly to me. And then many thousands of GitHub notifications. All of them want my attention. All of them want me to help them. All of them want me to help them for free. Uh, the payment part isn't even, like, that's a thing. Well, there's a slide for it later. It's not even the payment part. It's putting up with the BS. You can see I didn't swear there. <laughs> um, it's putting up with the BS. You, get, you create an issue template, they will ignore it. They will ignore the issue template. You ask them to provide more information, they will lecture you about how they don't need to provide you information. <laughs> you can do your very best. You can, spend, you can reply 12 times, and these people hate you. Now, most of them are nice. Most of them respect boundaries a little bit. Most of them will understand that the help that they're receiving is from an expert who created the project and that they can't really count on it. But a lot of them will do all sorts of manipulative tactics. And I fell for the manipulation. <laughs> and they squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and until there was nothing left, until I had no more love for code. Um, and uh, so I'm a jerk. <laughs> like I said in the subtitle here, I'm a jerk in a GitHub issue. I don't even go on GitHub issues anymore. Um, I go like once every three months uh, on, onto my GitHub queue. Uh, and when I go there, I mostly just like close issues and stuff. I'll go through the pull requests. Don't really even look through the issues. Um, I, like, I've had corporations with a trillion dollars make it weird when I ask for 200. And uh, what happened was I made the mistake. <laughs> I made the mistake of going out on my own um, and deciding to try to make it a full-time job. So I needed money. Once I needed money, all of a sudden people treated me like a beggar. Um, the open source system is broken, fully broken. I'm going to talk to you about the history of open source a little bit. Um, and we're not going to go deep into it. So this is a fairly academic field, I would say. I've read a fair amount of Wikipedia. I've watched many YouTube videos. There's a lot to learn. What I know about it is not very deep. Um, and if you find some like scholar <laughs> who's studied the history of Unix, um, they will like, uh, they would correct me on how I characterize things. There, there's a long history here. This is a quote that I found inspirational. 
So open source is just like one variant. It's just the one that people say. Uh, there's the free software movement. There's a lot of different ideologies. This is a philosophy. It's an ideology. Um, it's not just like a, it's not just in the readme or in the license.txt. This is a movement. <laughs> and it started back in the day when we didn't even have operating systems. Before we had operating systems, you're doing like punch card programming um, back in the 60s and stuff, um, Fortran, and they decided we want an operating system. And operating systems are really hard. <laughs> A lot of them were at uh, government funded things like Bell Labs and stuff. Like uh, a lot of them were at corporations, mostly, I think it was mostly government funded for a little while, and then also academic universities. And they're like, we want an operating system, but operating systems are really hard. Multiprocessing didn't really exist at the time. And so they created Unix, and then Linux, and then all the variants. And this quote, I'll read it. Um, here, I'll go over here. What we wanted to preserve was not just a good environment in which to do programming, but a system around which a fellowship could form. We knew from experience that the essence of communal computing, as supplied by remote access time-shared machines, is not just to type programs into a terminal instead of a key punch, but to encourage close communication. So there were programmers across universities, across the United States, across the world, who helped create the first operating systems. And this graph shows you some evolution of it. <laughs> you can see there were a lot of people involved. They were doing a lot of things. Um, from, that, uh, from that movement, there were various ideologies and philosophies that emerged the Free Software Movement um, and the Free Software Foundation, uh, Richard Stallman being famously associated with the Free Software Foundation. Um, the Free Software Foundation, uh, so Stallman's a jerk. I don't like him at all. He's also a misogynist, uh, but he's an important figure in uh, the Free Software Movement. Then we've got the Open Source Initiative. So this is a Committee, I'm going to tell it to you cynical. This is a rant after all. Um, so the Open Source Initiative is a committee bought by multinational corporations with billions of dollars to make sure that those corporations continue making money. They're the ones who get to decide what open source means. They, they create a definition of open source. Then they also go through every license that exists and then apply the definition to see whether it counts as open source. So the term open source is really just, you got like a committee gatekeeping what that term means. But there's a lot of variety beyond open source um, related, and it's usually related to licensing. I put the Linux logo up there as well. That reminds me of my childhood. <laughs> Pseudo exclamation point, exclamation point, enter, hope it works, no idea what the command is. That's what Linux started as for me. Um, yeah. Let's talk about software licensing. I could give a long talk about software licensing, and this is just one slide. Um, the software license is the legal portion of the open source and free software movement. That's what the license is. And there are hundreds thousands of licenses that you could use for your project. And you can also write your own. You can hire a lawyer and write your own. Um, now, I was talking earlier about the open source committee, um, the open source initiative. They don't like some licenses, and they do like other licenses. They're gatekeeping the definition of open source. And so they don't like the server-side public license, and they don't like the commons clause. I'm not even going to get into the differences uh, with the licenses, but I want to talk to you about what, how I view the purpose of the license. Um, for a lot of free software advocates, the purpose of the license is to make sure that the software remains not owned by one person or one company, but communally owned. 
And the way that you do that is you say, if you make any modifications to it, you have to let me see them. You have to put them up publicly, like GPL, LGPL, are often related to that. Um, who owns an open source project? No one. Like, who owns Project 64? No one owns Project 64. This is hundreds of developers over 20 years. The N64 is really old. <laughs> and this is hundreds of software developers. Some of them just do one contribution. One of them give five years of their life. But there's no one person who owns Project 64. There's no one corporation that owns Project 64. And um, yeah, so like uh, it's, it's about freedoms and rights and it's about ownership. Now let's talk about financial situation for open source. There are various ways to try to make money off of open source as a business or as an individual. Um, right here we have the open collective budgets for Webpack and for Babel which are two of the most popular projects um, in JavaScript. And um, in 2020, the Webpack core team essentially dismantled uh, because the donations disappeared with COVID. Um, however, if you can, if you look, so the people who created Webpack, Tobias, it, it's one person who did a lot of it, and then there's some other people surrounding them. <laughs> they all fled to a corporation so they could, they could get paid. But uh, for a while, they were independent. And these people are some of the best software developers in the world. <laughs> Webpack, like the Webpack project has provided billions, I'm not even joking, of value to so many companies. And what's the budget? Like that's not even what you make if you go to Google. One developer, like junior developer at Google, you're not even making that. Like you, you make more than that pretty easily in many areas of the United States. Um, in Utah, 200,000 is different than in San Francisco. But this is like one person, not an expert even, not the best developer in the world. And they're trying to fund a whole team off of it. <laughs> um, Babel uh, is similar. Like, uh, yeah. People, like, people are so entitled that they criticize Henry Zhu for how he spends his time. They're, they look at this budget and they're like, I see how much money you're making, Henry, off of Babel, and I don't think you're doing enough work. Just the, the pompousness, the arrogance. These people, uh, they, they see something transparent and they criticize it. They do not realize the, the cost <laughs> that these open source developers have paid. Now, okay, I need to wrap up here on time. Uh, this, is, this is my last slide. Um, well, there's one more, but it's empty. It just says, go for it, Joel. You can rant. <laughs> but um, corporations in 2022 now think that they can own open source. They think they can own it. Can you imagine the whole ideology, the whole philosophy has been completely undone <laughs> to the point where let me go through these four things. That's how we'll wrap up. Let me go through these four screenshots and explain to you what's happening. So copyright. Um, they put comments in their code with copyrights. Um, essentially what they're doing is they're threatening to sue you. Facebook is a multi-billion dollar corporation with lawyers and their, their lawyers have told them what to do to make sure that the people who contribute to the React project have absolutely no rights over React. You have to sacrifice everything um, as a contributor to the project. So this is copyright stuff. The bottom left here, um, this is the CLA. The Contributor Level Agreement, I think is what it stands for. Um, you have to sign this or they won't, won't merge your code. This, is, this forfeits all of the like, rights of ownership that contributors to open source people have. They're just trying to like legal bomb you. Up here at the top, these are two RFCs. 
So for anybody unfamiliar with RFC's request for comment, this is a way you can propose a change to the React project, a big change. You, want, you have a big idea for React, there's a repo. It's called the RFC. You go there and you propose it. When a Facebook employee proposes React hooks, the biggest change that's ever happened to React, <laughs> it is, you can't read, it's too blurry. In October, it is proposed. In November, it's merged. In up here, we have someone trying to talk about focus management in 2018, still unmerged and unclosed. Like, I'm not saying everything has to be merged. My point here is that they wield their GitHub privileges. They wield, uh, I'm not trying to be mean to the React core team here. All I'm trying to say is that Facebook has said, we own React, which is nonsensical, absolutely nonsensical for anybody familiar even remotely with open source or free software ideology. They're trying to claim ownership, like React is their private property. <laughs> That is not anybody who's done any level of research um, into the free software movement knows that, that that's just not, um, that's not the spirit of this. And then these same people have the audacity, <laughs> the audacity to say, we're doing open source, you should feel really good about it. And then uh, criticize, I've received criticism from people because I've tried to make money off of open source um, they, and they say, your license isn't good, your license isn't open source, they like go ideological with me. When this is, the, this is the state of open source in 2022, corporations tried to buy it and they sort of won. They sort of won. Uh, in 1990, 2000, we were sharing files illegally, torrenting LimeWire. Um, in 2022, <laughs> we uh, let them get through with the server-side loophole on the GPL. That's all. Thank you.